What kind of band earns two Emmys but never a single Grammy? The Monkees wouldn't have existed were it not for another rock band tied up in legal limitations. Who almost got the gig? Keep watching to find out. The Monkees was the brainchild of television producer Bob Rafelson, who wanted to create a show based on his own experiences as a musician. He sold the concept in 1965 and needed a rock band that could actually perform to make the show work. However, after it was deemed for legal reasons that they couldn't use the very real band The Lovin' Spoonful, he decided he'd just have to make up his own band. Rafelson placed an advertisement looking for musicians in some trade magazines. About 437 people responded to the app, including future legends Stephen Stills and Paul Williams, who both didn't get the gig. The only future monkey who showed up for that initial audition was Michael Nesmith. The four men who were eventually cast, Mickey Dolenz, Peter Tork, Davy Jones, and Nesmith, were relatively unknown, but they were all professionals. Nesmith and Tork were both accomplished musicians and performers. In fact, Stills recommended his friend Tork to Rafelson. Dolenz was a former child star who had headlined his own series called Circus Boy and Jones had received a Tony nomination in 1963 for his performance in Oliver. Although the four guys selected Be The Monkees all had performing and musical experience, they'd never played together before forming the band for the show. So Rafelson hired veteran music producer Don Kirshner to whip them into shape. This included weeks of rehearsals, acting classes, and filming a pilot. All that work paid off, and quickly. The first ad seeking musicians for the show appeared on September 8, 1965. Taping for the show began on May 31, 1966, and the Monkees' debut single, Last Train to Clarksville, was released on August 16, 1966, less than a year after the endeavor began. The show premiered on September 12, 1966, and the band's debut album, The Monkees, dropped on October 10. Both the single and the album hit number one on October 29, with the album actually knocking Revolver by The Beatles out of the top spot and it stayed there until it was dethroned by The Monkees' second album, More of the Monkees, which included the band's all-time classic, I'm a Believer, written by Neil Diamond. Though Rafelson had been floating the idea of a TV show about musicians since at least 1963, no one was interested until Beatlemania and the success of the Fab Four's movie, A Hard Day's Night. So it's not too surprising that the personas of The Monkees were explicitly based on The Beatles. In The Beatles, of course, Paul McCartney was known as the cute one, John Lennon the smart one, George Harrison was the quiet one, and Ringo was the clown. According to Closer Weekly, the four guys cast in The Monkees were explicitly given similar roles to play. Davy Jones was the cute one, Mickey Dolenz was the funny one, Mike Nesmith was the smart one, and Peter Tork got the thankless role of the clown. The way the Monkees were linked so explicitly to the Beatles earned them one of their earliest and most dismissive nicknames, the Prefab Four. Considering how incredibly successful the Monkees ultimately was, it's easily forgotten that the first version of the show's pilot was a disaster. In his autobiography, I'm a Believer, My Life of Monkees, Music, and Madness, drummer Mickey Dolenz says that all the TV networks turned down the pilot. That could have been the end of the story but Rafelson insisted on re-editing the pilot to try to save the day. Changes included cutting out the character of the band's manager, removing some title cards, and introducing raw footage from the cast's screen tests. The end result, which actually aired as episode 10 of the first season, is pretty ragged. The story makes little sense in its re-edited version, and many of the jokes were butchered, leaving behind punchlines without any sort of setup or context. The changes clicked with audiences, however, it was a hit with test groups, and NBC put in a series order for the fall of 1966. It's easy to dismiss The Monkees as a silly 1960s show exploiting the popularity of The Beatles, but in fact, it was truly a groundbreaking show in an artistic sense. It purposefully introduced avant-garde concepts like improvisation, jump cuts, and meta-referential humor that broke the fourth wall, and explicitly noted that it was a fictional TV show. It's hard for modern audiences to understand how groundbreaking The Monkees was, but considering that the top-rated sitcom on TV in 1966 was folksy sitcom The Andy Griffith Show gives you some idea of how different The Monkees really was. The AV Club reports that the show was one of the first to use postmodern techniques, like Mickey Dolan's walking off to talk to the writers directly, or Davy Jones stopping in the middle of a scene to ask for a second take. In Why the Monkeys Matter, Teenagers, Television, and American Pop Culture, 
Author Roseanne Welch notes that the monkeys used a metatextual approach to challenge other limitations. In one episode, Peter Tork makes a deal with the devil, and the band discusses going to hell. But each time they say hell, it's bleeped out due to television censorship, leading to Mickey saying, You know what's even more scary? What? You can't say <laughs> on television. The monkeys didn't invent the music video. There are plenty of examples of musical short films going back decades. And the TV show didn't even pioneer the fast editing and energy that we associate with modern music videos. The Beatles kind of did that with A Hard Day's Night. But the musical segments on The Monkees differed from more traditional TV shows in that they were often presented as separate from the narrative, essentially as music videos dropped in the middle of the story. These energetic scenes were called romps, and they were a big part of the show's popularity, as they were different from anything else on television. And they ended up having a huge impact on pop culture, thanks in part to Mike Nesmith. Following the end of the series, Nesmith, who was independently wealthy thanks to an inheritance, continued to develop the music video form as part of his solo career. He eventually developed the music video TV series Pop Clips, which was bought by Warner Brothers in 1981 and expanded into a whole new network called MTV. When The Monkees debuted in 1966, there was something extremely unusual about the show that today's audiences might not notice. There was no adult character to offer the band moral guidance and advice. As guitarist Peter Tork told the Concord Monitor, this was really unheard of. Every comedy before had an adult mentor figure, but the Monkees presented a group of young people figuring stuff out all on their own. As the generation gap widened in the 1960s, this was a pretty notable artistic decision. Of course, the original pilot for the show did have a senior adult figure to offer guidance to the band, their manager. But after the pilot was recut by producer Bob Rafelson, the manager appeared only briefly and was never mentioned again. The Monkees is a comedy with distinct slapstick roots, so it makes sense that there are connections to the Three Stooges. The interactions between the band members often echoes the way Larry Moe and Curly would rapid-fire jokes and perform physical comedy, and that's intentional. According to Dolan's, the producers made the cast watch films by the Three Stooges in order to learn those skills. And author Jonathan Etter notes that director Irving Lippmann, who directed 56 of the 58 episodes of The Monkees, had directed several Three Stooges films before working on the show. And according to Woman's World, the show even repurposed a lot of the sets and props that the Three Stooges had used in their films, including a pair of pajamas worn by both Curly Howard and Peter Tork. The Monkees would have been a different show if the Three Stooges hadn't existed. As author Jake Austin notes in TV A Go Go, Rock on TV from American Bandstand to American Idol, The Monkees was a scripted show, but the scripts were very loose. Television Academy reports that the romps in each episode and a lot of the dialogue were improvised by the cast. That improv spirit gave the show its zany energy and contributed to its rule-breaking success. But it had a downside. The lack of a strict script meant timing out the episodes was impossible. And as a result, many of the episodes came in short. Due to the meta nature of much of the show's humor, being a minute short as usual became a recurring joke on the show. Of course, then we've only got one minute in which to say everything that's on your minds, don't you? Uh, collectively, have you got something to say that's really important? Well, that's the <laughs> According to author Roseanne Welch, the producers solved this problem by adding interviews with the cast and crew to the end of short episodes. This may have started as an easy way to extend an episode, but it quickly became a popular aspect of the show, and is another example of the monkeys breaking new ground by further dissolving the line between actor and character, something that other shows and movies soon emulated. Now, it's clear that uh, every time that, uh, you know, uh, the hippies come up with something really vital and intelligent and interesting, uh, the establishment will take it over and put down the people who originated it. Even those who have fond memories of the monkeys sometimes fall into the trap of thinking of it as a slight comedy that rode the coattails of Beatlemania. But even back in the 60s, some people recognized that the monkeys was a really great show. In fact, the show actually won two Emmy Awards during its run, picking up one for Outstanding Comedy Series and a second for Outstanding Directorial Achievement in Comedy for the work of director James Frawley on the episode Royal Flush in 1967. In Total Control, the Michael Nesmith story, author Randy L. Massengill reports that The Monkees taking two Emmys was a bit of a shock. The Dick Van Dyke show had just ended after dominating the award for years, and everyone expected an established show with better ratings to win. 
The Monkees were hugely successful and popular during the first season of their show, but much of the viewing public assumed, incorrectly, that they wrote and performed their own music. In fact, a killer group of songwriters wrote most of the material on The Monkees' first two albums, including Carol King, Neil Sedaka, and Harry Nielsen. And some of the best session musicians in the world recorded the music for their albums, including the legendary Wrecking Crew. The Hollywood Reporter explains that when the band's lack of involvement in their early songs became widely known, there was a backlash. What the public may not have known, though, is that the members of the band actually wanted to make the music themselves. And as the series became more popular, they did exactly that, taking on more and more playing and songwriting duties and touring live extensively. Despite the show's popularity, and despite the band's increasing musical skills, a third season of The Monkees never happened. According to Woman's World, the band didn't like the creative direction of the series and instead wanted to switch to a variety show format for the third season. But NBC wasn't on board, so when the band refused to do a third season as a sitcom, the series was over. Still, for a show that lasted just two seasons in the late 1960s, The Monkees remains pretty prominent in pop culture. The reason for that is simple. Syndication and MTV. The Monkees went into syndication on CBS in 1969, where it ran on Saturday mornings. An entire new generation of kids was exposed to its charms as they ate their cereal. And when the show went into general syndication in 1975, that audience expanded to include the entire country. Then, in 1986, MTV began airing old episodes of The Monkees and something unexpected happened. The reruns were among MTV's highest-rated programs. This sparked a second wave of monkey mania. Four of the band's old albums re-entered the charts, the band reunited for a successful tour, and they even eventually began recording new music. Sadly, the Monkees lost singer Davy Jones in 2012, when he passed away at the age of 66. Seven years later, in 2019, Peter Tork also passed away at the age of 77. But despite these losses, the Monkees will always live on in the hearts of their fans thanks to their great music and their groundbreaking TV show. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite music acts are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.